book of Matthew, chapter 2. Levi the publican, folks. Levi. Yes, sir. In other words, the tax collector. He's the IRS agent in the Bible. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 1. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship. Father, bless his holy book now. In your name I pray. You can be seated. Amen. I love the story of the wise men from the east. I love that. The reason I do is because here are people who did not have the privileges of Israel, and yet they had a heart. They had a heart for the truth. They wanted the truth, and because they wanted it, God gave it to them. And so we have this as, and of course, if you study the chronology, you'll find out that they didn't come to the manger. They more than likely was a couple of years until they showed up, and they showed up when the child was in the house. This past Wednesday night, I talked about the necessity of the virgin birth. If you weren't here, I'd like for you to hear what I'm saying. The necessity of the, of the virgin birth. There's two main reasons for the necessity of the virgin birth. Number one is Matthew chapter 1 is the royal line of King David to give a son to sit on the throne of David. But when you go back and read in the Old Testament, you'll find that Jeconias was such an apostate, the Lord took Yah, he took his name off of the front of it and called him Kaniah. And here he shows up in Matthew chapter number 1 in the genealogy of Christ. Obviously, Matthew was fully aware of this. And so therefore, by putting him in the genealogy, Matthew chapter number 1, he, was, he disqualified all those that followed him to be the king. So Matthew says he was born of a virgin. And he, bring, he introduces the virgin in Matthew 1 because the virgin birth is the only way that the throne of David could be uh, legitimized yes. through this genealogy of Solomon and on down the line. Another genealogy shows up in the Gospel of Luke. It's the genealogy of the man. We find the comparison of Luke's, gospel, Luke's genealogy and Matthew's genealogy. The big difference between the two is the line from Solomon and the line from Nathan. David had four sons, Nathan one of them, Solomon the other, and we have their genealogies. More than likely, the genealogy of Matthew chapter, Mark, Luke chapter number two, is the genealogy of Mary, and makes her a royal descendant of David. So, on both sides, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, royal descendants of David. Second reason that it was necessary for the virgin birth is because the man passes the curse of sin onto his family. We read that in Romans chapter number five, and the apostle told us in First Timothy that for the one man, for the first man. Death entered into the world, and so sin by death. Not by the woman, she sinned first, but by the man. And when the man sinned, he brought death into the world. Therefore, sin is passed from the father on down to the generation. So the Lord Jesus Christ does not have an earthly father. He has God Almighty as his father. Therefore, the curse has been done away with. That's two of the reasons for the virgin birth. And make no mistake about it. Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse 14 makes it very clear. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. I believe in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in the scripture how that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and announced to her that she would have a child. Gabriel is a Hebrew word. It means man of God. The Bible said, I am he that stands before the Lord. He's what we would call more than likely an archangel sent for a specific reason, an archangel, because nothing is going to stop him. Nothing will stay his hand. All the devils in hell could not stop Gabriel from coming and announcing to Mary that she would have a child. It is also a startling message to Mary because she was a virgin. How in the world is this going to happen, she said to him, seeing I know not a man. And then he explained to her how a supernatural event was going to take place that had never happened before upon this earth and will never happen again. It was a one-time thing that this virgin would be impregnated from the power of Almighty God. He said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. When you look at that, do a little research into the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. You'll find out he's talking about the glory of God coming down upon this maiden. Yeah. 
And when we study the glory of God, we find out that it's quite a remarkable thing because there is that part of the glory of God that can be seen with human eyes. But there is that part of the glory of God that cannot be seen with human eyes. If you'll remember, when they dedicated the temple to the Lord, the priests were inside that temple, but they were driven out because of the thick darkness, the Bible says. And the Lord said, I will dwell in the thick darkness. If you let your mind go back into the past, imagine a time when there was no light, no planets, no stars, no anything. There was absolutely nothing. And it was pure blackness and dark. And my friend, if you let your mind go back to a time like that, you'll understand that even though there was no creation, the Creator still lived on. He had lived from everlasting to everlasting. That was a manifestation of the glory of God. He wanted these priests to understand that when they went into the temple of the Lord to offer up a sacrifice, they could only partially understand the glory of God because they were not instructed in the darkness. They were simply told that it would happen. And of course, it has to do with the fact that it says in Genesis chapter number one, God said, let there be light. And when he spoke light forth, it came forth for his creation. But my dear friend, before he said that, there was no sun, there was no moon, there was none of these things that give light. It was pure, total darkness. And he spoke out of the darkness and brought light forth to his creatures. This was a light that is no doubt in my mind that overshadowed the sun and made it look like a tar pit compared to the glory of Almighty God. This is the glory the angel Gabriel said that shall come down upon this little virgin girl. When we read about that glory in the Old Testament, we'll find out that it shows up in a number of places, and it's very instructive. The Scripture taught that that glory resided over the top of the tabernacle, that there was a beautiful manifestation of the glory of God. The glory of God would rise up, and Israel would follow that in the daytime, and then the glory of God would come down at night as a wall of fire to keep the enemy away. The glory of God, my dear friend, at one time when Israel became so apostate, it got up and left the tabernacle, and it went to the top of the hill there at, uh, across from Kidron, the Mount Kidron, the Mount of Olives. And it stayed and it looked back at that temple. And this is one of the most remarkable things in the Bible. It was as if God was saying, I have to do what I have to do, but I don't want to do it. But he looked back at that temple with a place of the sacrifice and he stayed for a moment. And then the Bible said he lifted himself up and his glory departed to the east. That's happened right before Israel was carried off into Babylon in captivity. The glory of God arose in the fire of Manoah when they brought Samson into this world. The fire of the burning bush when Moses stood before it. The consuming fire that did not consume. The bush that burned but was not consumed. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 29 our God is a consuming fire. He is untouchable. He is unknowable. He is unapproachable but he my dear friend today is almighty God because we know the light that came into the world. The men that sat in darkness have seen a great light and that light is our Lord Jesus Christ. Forget every religion on this earth. Every religion on this earth is a lie. It's deception. It leads you astray. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The Bible said in John chapter number one, he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Understand all that? No, I don't. And the implications are profound. But I do know this. I know the time will come when Every one of Adam's race that breathes air into their lungs will give an account to him. He's almighty. He's the judge. And we all must face that judgment seat of Christ. The glory of God then came down upon this virgin daughter of Zion. I suppose it may very well have been that glory that no eye hath seen. Man cannot see, nor can he see. No eye hath seen. No man has ever seen that glory. The apostle Paul tells us, nor can he see that glory. And that glory came down upon this virgin daughter of Zion and wrapped her in light and yet if you've been standing there you couldn't have seen the light but it was a light that is brighter than the sun because it is a spiritual light and when he wrapped her in light the Holy Ghost brought the seed of God down and impregnated her that day she had God Almighty 
in her womb. That's the virgin birth. Man had nothing to do with it. And she, my friend, conceived in the light because she bore the light and she gave birth to the light and he is the light. And every day since I've been saved in 1973, hallelujah God, I know the light. And the light has given me a path to walk upon. So this glory came down upon her. And she was wrapped in the glory of God. And God made himself known to man through a virgin birth. People mock today. They make fun of it. They say, well, good night, man. Don't you understand? That's a biological impossibility. Nothing is impossible with God. He spoke into existence every life we know. What in the world makes you think that would be hard for the Almighty to do? If he can raise the dead and he can raise the dead, he can give life where there is no life. His word that goes forth brings life. What do you think about giving a virgin birth to the daughter of Zion? And so she was wrapped in glory. And she was wrapped in glory that the devil couldn't see. The angels couldn't see. The cherubim and seraphim could not see it. This is the glory of God that you'll only see when he lets you see it. You'll only know it when he lets you know it. You'll only know him the full fullness of who he is when he lets you know the full fullness of who he is. This is why the apostle John said, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, we shall see him as he is. Amen. Amen. Take that and think on that. Meditate on sea law, as they say. We shall see him as he is. That Bible said we no longer know him after the flesh. It's good that we know him after the flesh. It's good that we go to the cross at Calvary and understand these things. But my dear friend, he arose on the third day and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And now he lives. He lives. He lives. Hallelujah to God to bring life to us. Praise his holy name. And so, in the presence of God, that glory reigns. You see, for 33 and one half years on this earth, a man walked a sinless, perfect man. This man never broke the law of God, never had a bad thought in his mind, never one time failed to please the Father. And when he ascended to the presence of God, he ascended in righteousness, my dear friend, that had never existed before. It was righteousness that came into being at Christ. It is the righteousness of the God man that's what you are given that's put to your account but here's the thing when he arose in the presence of God he carried his glory with him this is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And my dear friend, that glory was carried up into the presence of God. So what glory are you talking about? I'm talking about the glory of the God, man. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. The glory of that seed came down and impregnated the virgin. But the glory of the sinless Son of God, who arose from the dead, ascended back into the presence of the Father. I'm going to see that glory one day. Now, I don't know about you, but my dear friend, I'm curious. I want to see that glory. I want to see heaven. I want to see the streets of gold, the walls of earth. I want to see the angels and the cherubim and seraphim. I want to see the apostles. But I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said we shall see him as he is. Then God shall be all in all. There's something about the Trinity that only we will be able to see one day when God comes together before us as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And there's no way you're wasting your time now to try to figure that out. But we'll see him as he is. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you want to go around here and if you want to spend your time looking at tree, speech, uh, tree, uh, streets of transparent gold, go ahead. But I want to find the Son of God and I want to see that one who died for me. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5, in him is no darkness at all. No darkness whatsoever. No darkness. You see, my dear friend, even though it was dark for the human eye, even though it was no dark, it was dark, and there's no, no eye could see it, he wasn't dark. He's never been dark. It was the glorious light of the spiritual light of Almighty God. You're going to see that one day. I, I just keep going on with this. Are you following me? Are you following me? Most people think, well, you know, I've seen this and I've seen that and my eyes, yes, my friend, but we're going to a place where those two eyes right there are useless when it comes to God manifesting his glory. That's what I'm talking about. It's not that you won't see with these eyes things that God would have you see, but my dear friend, everything we're talking about up there, the new Jerusalem is something that came into being. God did not come into being and you'll see that glory one day.
spiritual light shines much brighter than that little ball up there in the sky that we call the sun. That's just a flickering candle compared to the spiritual light. Have you had that light? I don't have to, I don't have to make you, I don't have to persuade you in that. If you've ever had the light of the Holy Ghost open you up and open you up wide and show you who Jesus Christ is and show you who you are and show you your real need to be saved, then you've had a taste of that light that I'm talking about, a spiritual light. Nobody can take that from you. So we may not be able to fully understand. And that's okay. I don't have to figure out everything about God. No, sir, I don't have to strut around and say I'm a scholar of the Bible, hogwash. Nobody on this earth is a scholar of a living book. Amen. It's alive. Every word of God is alive. So the Bible said he'll come a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Little virgin girl, you're going to bring into this world the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Who am I? She probably said. Wait a minute. Moses said that. Who am I? You want to do this? Where'd I come from? I'm just a Jewish girl here. And you two come to me. God makes no mistakes. He chose her because he knew her. He knew her before the foundation of the world. And he chose her to bear his son. And so he said, you'll bring forth a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ is the Greek word Christos. It's the equivalent Old Testament Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. And Lord in the Old Testament is like when they come to the Tetragrammaton, yod Hey vow Hey, they say Adonai. That's Lord, Adonai. He's the Lord. Yes, yes. What's that mean to be Lord? That means he's boss, he's king, he's everything. Yes. He owns it all. Yes. Yes. So you bring forth Christ the Lord. What is he going to do? He's going to save. He's going to deliver from bondage. Some of you know what it is to be delivered from bondage. Some of you don't. You're still in bondage. But my friend, that's such a wonderful thing to be delivered from drugs, to be delivered from alcohol, to be, for, be delivered from sex addiction, addiction, to be delivered from pornography, to be delivered from all this garbage that Satan throws upon you. It's a good thing, wonderful thing. First step in being delivered is to get on your knees and say, God, I got a problem. Amen. Confess it. Own up to it. That's what my grandfather used to say when I'd mess up. He'd say, own up to it. <laughs> they knew what they were talking about. It's yours. You did it. Now own up to it. And you did it too. You took your first shot of dope. You're the first one who started looking at your pornography. You're the first one. You're the one that did it. You made your choices. And you thought that when the devil told you, well, that you're living for pleasure. Hedonism is what they call it. And there's a lot of them out there living for it, but they don't understand payday's coming one day. Amen. He'll deliver you. He'll deliver you. He's the Savior. There are murderers walking the street right now. It's just important what I'm saying to you now. Smash and grab. Have you seen that happening? Yeah. They break into buildings and they, yeah. and they bust up the display cases and they carry the stuff off and away they go. And now the news media says, well, now the reason this is happening depends on who you're listening to. If you're listening to the liberal crowd... Like our, like our Speaker of the House gets up and says, I don't have a clue what's causing all this. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, bottom line, regardless, one way or the other, sin's the problem. <laughs> but anyway, the other side says, well, now, here's the issue. They are defunding the police, all right? The DAs will not prosecute the cases. Even in California, they are saying anything below $1,000 is a misdemeanor, no longer a felony. And on and on and on and on and on it goes. And when they arrest one and goes before the judge, he sends him out that same day and there's no bail. And so the bottom line is that they've been very soft on crime. Here's the point. By being soft on crime, they've lowered the gates down. You see, they, they corral the lawbreakers in. They corral them in. That's what the law's for. The law is given to keep the lawbreaker corralled in. He knows that if he breaks the law, he's going to pay for it. And that's a point that I'm trying to get across to you this morning. And the Old Testament is full of the law. God gave it at Sinai, the law. He gave the, he gave the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. He gave, it, he gave them the law. They say the Jews have 613 laws. Law giver. Moses is the law giver. What's he giving, preacher? He's showing you where the bounds are. He's putting the gates and walls up about you. Well, what's the difference? 
You keep a man in prison for 20 years, you turn him loose. He's still a thief. Amen. Still a thief. The law cannot change you. It can't do a thing to make you better. You see, this is the difference between grace and law, a savior and law. You see, the nature of the person has to be changed. Once you change their nature, they're no longer thieves and murderers. They change their nature. You don't need laws anymore. You can tear down the walls and open the gates. Once you change their nature, therefore, when you step into the very glory of God in the presence of the Holy One, ain't no laws up there. Amen. No laws anywhere. Why? Because every last one of them that go through that place will have pure, clean, redeemed souls. And any of like you take, for example, you've got a city, the New Jerusalem. Where does it come from? It comes down from God where? Down here. Why does it come down here? Because outside the walls, read it in Revelation. Outside the walls are the filthy, the unclean, the murderers, and all them. Outside the walls. That makes my point is I don't know what else to say to make my point. So what do you do, preacher? The judicial system, will that save them? No, it won't. Laws won't save you. Some of you are hooked up with keeping laws, and some of you are hooked up with doing this and that, and right and wrong and all of that. Let me tell you something. Once you ever get made free inside your soul and inside your spirit, you'll hunger for right and wrong. You'll hunger for the truth. You'll love the Word of God. I love the Ten Commandments. When I look at them, I say, Oh, Lord, I know I broke them. But thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Hallelujah to God. Smash and grab. The law keeps them corralled. And the only thing that can make a difference is to change their nature. The nature. There's no law that can do that. No law can change the nature. Your flesh will never overcome your flesh. It has no power to do it. Oh, no power. You say, Preacher Lawson, if I, what you say is really true, you mean to tell me that if I came down here and got on my face before God and opened up my soul, opened up to God, not man, opened it up to God. I open up my soul and I start telling the Lord my problems, what's inside me, my fears, my doubts, my unbelief and all that, that he can help me? Yes. And let me tell you how he'll help you. Nothing big and spiritual may happen today, but here's what will happen. He'll turn the light on. Once he turns the light on inside your soul, you begin to see as the way God sees. That's what's important. That's wisdom in the Bible. That's wisdom. Not knowledge, wisdom. Wisdom is when you begin to see the way God sees. That's the wise man in the book of Proverbs. If you just ask him to do that, that's all. That's all I ask today. I'm not asking you to come down here and get on your knees and pound the floor and come crying out with some holy sounding thing and this Amen. and that. No, no. Just come to him and say, Lord, I'm all these things. Would you help me? And he will. He'll turn the light on. And when he turns that light on, you'll see a difference begin to take place in your life until you finally come like that uh, Canadian police officer. How many remember him? How many didn't hear about him? Some of you didn't. I got a letter the other day, email from a Canadian, two Canadian police officers, a Manitoba, I think it is. And they were together, and he was playing my messages to him. And this guy was an atheist, atheist, atheist. But he started playing the messages to him. He said after about a year, I think it was, I don't know exactly how long, he said he started asking questions. The atheist did. Started asking questions. You know why he asked questions? Light was coming on. Light was coming on. And so we began to speak to him, try to help him. And then finally, the two of them got together. And he didn't take him down the Romans road. Do you know what he did? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And he said when that cop raised his head up, that he changed, his face was full of glory, 
He had a hunger for the word of God. He's read the Bible through three times. He got something from God that stuck with him. And it's not so much the prayer you pray. There's a lot of good prayers in there. I'm not against any prayers. It's the condition of your heart. It's all it took. It's all it took. All it took. The light came on. Then he got more light. And he got more light. More light. And the day will come. The more light you get, the more you're going to love him. And the more you love him, the more he'll let you see you. And my prayer is to the Almighty is, Lord, give me eyes, not these, but eyes in my soul, that I may see what I know man cannot see. Folks, I'm going. I'm going. I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but I'm going. And I'm getting ready. You getting ready, brother? Well, I know you are. We're getting ready. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I want to see him. I'll see God. Father, in Jesus' name, I know there's people in here this morning that they're not sure. I understand that. And I'm not condemning them and picking them to death for it. I'm simply making a statement. They need help. They may have tried religion. They may have tried a church. They may have been through some formula. They may have been through the mill. But it didn't do them any good. Heavenly Father, show them how simple it is. How simple, simple, simple it is to come to God. The heads are bowed. Anybody raise your hand and say, Lord, Preacher, I want you to pray for me because God's doing something in my soul and I don't want to turn him away. I want him to continue to do it. He started a work in me. I opened a card this morning and it came from some folks. They've, been, they've come to the church here and they said, Preacher, we want you to know how much we thank God for what you preached because it put our family back together again. There's a hand back there in the back. There's a hand in the back. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you over here. There's another hand. Anybody else? God bless you up here. Anybody with a raise your hand? This is the house of prayer, folks. It's the house of God. Anybody else raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. I cannot, God bless you back here. I cannot come between you and God, and I will not try that. But I will pray for you. I'll intercede for you. Before I pray, anybody else raise a hand. God bless you back here. Got hands all over the place. God bless every one of you. God bless every one of you. Back here in the back. Father, Lord, you know what I've done. I'm just the preacher. That's all I am, Lord. And I bless your sweet holy name, for you were good to me when I didn't deserve it, but you were. Father, I pray for these dear folk. Lord, I know how confused religion can get. And I know how when man puts himself into it, most of the time he's doing it for his own, own glory and his own praise. And we don't want that. I pray for them. I pray, Father, you just put a simple light, childlike hunger and faith inside them and lead them, lead them, lead them, lead them to the truth. In thy holy name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's stand up.